and welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at youtube.com slash cover3 and everywhere you get your podcasts on demand. Thanks for hanging out. Smash that subscribe. Smash that like and come and join us in the chat, a.k.a. the Cover 3 tailgate. Oh, Tom, we are getting back into it with the people of the cover three tailgate we are going to open up the big old bag of mail uh we're going to be going to the cover three tailgate for some live mailbag questions we do have um a few so, some buzz on the coaching carousel regarding a power five job we've got the, a group of five a uh, group of five commissioner who's retiring i don't really have a take on that but uh a farewell that we have for a group of five head coach who is retiring as well and it is Thursday. It is 11 a.m. You know we've got some locks. Army-Navy locks coming up this, that game coming up this Saturday. We'll get into that in a little bit. But as promised, ooh, what happened to all my comments that I starred? They all got unstarred. I see them still. You see all of them? I just see one. There were three. Yeah. Hang on. All right, here we go. Let's see. We are going to start with all right let's do this one from kyle you're a high school quarterback that's a mid-level four-star does it make sense to go to a top school or go to a group of five school knowing that you can ball out and get a big payout and then you just portal a year or two down the road so you're going to get more playing time and you might be able to get more interest from that big school and maybe a bigger payday. So you are in the position of this mid-level four-star high school quarterback. What do you think? It's a good question. Um, I don't know. I, I think it really would be dependent on the situation. Like if I'm going to the big school, am I playing right away? Am I going to sit? What do I want to do? Uh, that I think that that is an, legitimate route to take if you wanted you can go to a g5 but you could also just you don't have to go to a g5 you could go to a power five just not you know the blue blood power five you can go to a mid-level power five start there get the same kind of attention do it against better competition which would only increase your value in the transfer portal if they've seen you do it within the power five level and then you know the big school comes and throws a ton of money at you like you look at just look at last year. Now, these are all, you know, speculation and rumors. But there was one G5 quarterback in Michael Pratt who did really well at Tulane and got a whole lot of interest in the transfer portal from bigger schools who were, you know, reportedly offering him a hefty sum of money to come transfer to their school. He turned them down. Then there was also Drake May, who was at an ACC school that did well, who had NFL aspirations and still does who was also reportedly having a lot of money thrown at him to transfer and go to another school with maybe a national title, you know, on the line instead of at North Carolina where you're doomed to go eight and four for the rest of eternity. So um, I don't think there is a direct way. I do think that if you are a quarterback, you've got a good shot to make money at the college level period. As long as you're skilled enough to play, no matter where you go, if you go and you play well, somebody will offer you money. It might be the school you're already at just to keep you from leaving. So that's the one thing about the NIL that is going to, you know, it, it already reflects the NFL. The, the quarterbacks are the ones getting most of the money, like the, the, the value positions, your quarterbacks, your offensive linemen, your pass rushers and your corners. Those guys get a ton of money to stay or go to new schools. All right. Let's uh, thank you, Kyle. Let's also go to that question from Mark the Georgia proposition. Mm -hmm. if got Georgia, that? Yeah. yeah, here we go. Mark from the cover three tailgate says if Georgia had won the sec, would Texas have been in over Florida state? Yeah. You think if, so? Yeah. If there, what, what was their purpose for putting Alabama in? What did they say? They kept saying the Jordan Travis injury. Yeah. Like in Dodd had reported, there was one, he talked to somebody on the committee who just said the reason he said they boiled down to the fact we didn't think Florida State could win it. That's why they kept him out, which I could spend 20 minutes on the logic of the team that hasn't lost a game. We don't think they're capable of winning it, but the teams that have lost games, we think they can. I could talk about that, but no, just the process was clear. Had Georgia won, the playoff would probably be 
Georgia, Georgia Michigan, Michigan, Washington, Texas, Washington, and Texas. Yeah. And it would be just as wrong. It would be just as stupid. But yeah, it's, uh, it, yeah, nothing would have changed. It would be the same. Thank you, Mark, and uh, continue to keep filling up the Cover 3 tailgate with questions. We'll grab as many as we can. Uh, now, let's uh, let's go for a spin. Let's check out the latest from the coaching carousel. Mel Tucker. Uh, was was he the first coach fired? And that's why we put him on the coaching carousel. Oh, uh, yeah. We just want to remember that one for a long time. I was, it was a little bit of combination of everything because Mel was the first one fired. And then when we were going through our, uh, our brainstorming sessions for our graphics back when we were having them created, it was still very fresh in our minds. So I was like, yeah, we should definitely include Mel on there and get him tossed off of it. Yeah. Uh, all right. So let's start with the, what we know. Okay. Craig Bull retiring as the head coach at Wyoming. We remember that before he was the Wyoming head coach, he was the head coach at North Dakota State. Incredibly successful there. And at Wyoming, I think he's done a great job. Stylistically, they definitely have an identity, um, one that we have honestly, you know, just really celebrated every single time that it's going to be windy in Laramie. And those conditions will still bring about our assumption, but Tom, we got to be honest. We got to thank Craig Bull and the way that he approaches a football game for being able to go hand in hand with the wind and the sun in Laramie to, uh, to give us so many unders so many. I'm wearing my wonders watching on youtube.com slash cover three. I'm wearing my wonders hoodie right now. Um, what sort, sort of thoughts, I guess it on thoughts on Craig Bull's time at Wyoming, but also like what, what kind of and they have already, by the way, announced the um we, we're promoting internally moving forward. Jay Solville is going to be the next head coach. Is is the expectation that the the program keeps running as it as it has been? Are our expectations for Wyoming still the same? I don't know. Um, it's it's an interesting spot because like obviously Bowl came after having tremendous amount of success at North Dakota state. He'd won three straight division one national titles at the FCS level. Like they went 33 and two over a three year span, won three national titles. He leaves for the Wyoming job and like Wyoming is not the easiest job. Like it's, it's got support. It has fan support because you know, it's, it's the really the only show in town when yeah. it comes to like sports in Wyoming for the most part. But it is not the easiest place to recruit to because it's, you know, it's remote and it's hard to get players there. You're typically not going after top recruits. You're kind of getting guys like Josh Allen who maybe are late developers or who just kind of slipped in the cracks of evaluations from other schools. And it really requires somebody who can, you know, build a program, develop players and has a significant, like a certain style. But even now in the transfer portal era, like we saw last year, they had like, I think it was three guys from their offense enter the portal mm -hmm. and like Levi Williams is one. They replaced him with Peasley. So that might've been more of a coaching decision, playing time decision, but they lost, you know, their running back or receiver. They lost a bunch of key guys to the portal and it's going to be much more difficult in this job for everybody at this level to keep those players when they do develop them. But more so than anything, not about, it's not about J Jay Savell. It's about what bowl has been. Like we have talked about it with a lot of the hires that we have seen, in recent jobs and a couple we'll probably get to here in a minute where you're hiring a coach when, when they typically have success at every single level they've been at, there's a reason for it. it. It's, it's sticky. It goes to the next and they're able to build a solid program, which is what he did at Wyoming where no, they're not winning 10, 11 games a year. They're not winning the mountain West every season. In fact, I don't think they ever won it, but they're going bowling every year, which for Wyoming is hard to do. It's a testament to what Craig bowl was able to do. I don't know if Jay Savell can do that. I'm not saying he can't, but Bull came with a very solid kind of blueprint for what he's doing. Of course, Savell has worked for Bull. He knows the blueprint. Right. He can probably keep that going. He knows the plan. So I would be optimistic, but I don't know that I could say for certain it's going to happen, no. I think that 
there is now a standard and an expectation. And for a little while, I don't know if I had that for Wyoming football. Mm -hmm. I didn't go in every single year and assume that this was going to be a team that was in a bowl game. And I did not go in there every year and assume that it was going to be a top half of the Mountain West kind of team. And under Craig Bowl, there was a consistency in performance and a consistency in the finish where that was an expectation. So as we move forward, my expectations are going to remain unchanged. If Jay Savell doesn't meet those expectations, he's got this Craig Bowl tenure that we can point to and say, look, that's the standard. Like that is what Wyoming football can be. And you're definitely right about the transfer portal because what happens when, I don't know, uh, anywhere state says, hey, how's the social scene in Laramie? Hey, you want to come? You want to come here? You know, like it's, it is going to be tough, but. If you recruit to an identity, you recruit the kind of players that are going to embrace it. Um, I, I absolutely think that even though you're losing a coach with legitimate championship rings, you you still can be able to build on that success uh, and make sure that uh, it's not dropping off after he leaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's it's the good news is like the wind will remain in Laramie, and we could still count on that. But hopefully. The style of play she remains the same too, or maybe you no. Know, maybe they come in and do the air raid in thirty mile per hour winds. That would be fun would, to see how that goes. Would not suggest that. I'll tell you how that ends. That ends with a lot of interceptions. Okay, you try you try throwing the ball forty times with unpredictable wind gusts. <laughs> so, I don't think that. They, yeah. What if that's what was Josh Allen's accuracy? Josh Allen's accuracy <laughs> It's also windy in Buffalo. Maybe that's the problem right now. Wow. Put this man in a dome, all right? Oh, wow. I'm going to be thinking about this for a while. If, like, Josh Allen was a Raider, would he throw for 30,000 yards a season? Maybe. Let us know in the chat. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, all right, so we've got a little bit of buzz here on Thursday morning coming out of Duke where Manny Diaz has reportedly emerged as the focus of the search. Um, you know, he's a Penn State defensive coordinator, former head coach at Miami, former defensive coordinator at Miami, and uh, other stops as an assistant uh, in the ACC. He knows the ACC. What are some of the initial thoughts if, if this does end up moving forward? Uh, reports from ESPN's Pete Thamel and others indicating that one way or another, we, we might know if Diaz is going to be the guy in the next 24 hours. Yeah, I, I think this is an interesting hire. I it's I think if you look at Diaz's tenure as a head coach, like I don't know if you could say he got like a a fair shake at Miami. Like no. I, I so it's you look at it, he was 21 and 15 in three seasons, but he was 16 and nine in conference play. And to be frank, like if you look at Miami the last few years, that's it's on the higher end of what yes. they've been able to do for quite a while. So I I think that he has the ability to win games. I think going to Duke, like maybe he'll get the time that he needs to actually implement his style. Because like the thing about Manny is he's an incredible defensive coordinator. Like mm -hmm. everywhere he's gone, his defenses have been tremendous. They bring a lot of pressure. They confuse the living hell out of college quarterbacks who have no idea where the pressure is coming from or when. And it just kind of rattles them. And you can see when they're playing. Like they, a lot of guys are unsure. Like that's just tangent here. Like when evaluating guys for like NFL draft stuff, Manny Diaz's defenses are one of the defenses that I like to watch them play against because you see if they're rattled or if they're calm. And I think that is something that is worth paying attention to when you're trying to figure out how a guy is going to do at the next level. Anyways, back to Manny Diaz and Duke. I do think that considering he's replacing Elko, who was a defensive coordinator himself, like you've kind of got the pieces in place in that in that sense as far as it won't be a drastic change from what they've been doing and if you're duke and you've got that kind of momentum going i think you kind of want to keep that momentum so ds comes in it's not going to completely flip everything my assumption is based on the offense he ran at miami it wouldn't be that different like it it wasn't the same it was more pro style at miami mm -hmm. but i do think that you know you could it's not that big of an adjustment, honestly. The difference between pro style and spread is really just kind of going away. It's all the same thing for the most part now. So I think that if he gets time, he's somebody who can, you know, do what Duke wants to do, which is be a program that is going to be competing for bowl games. Because we know Duke's not going to win the ACC. We know Duke's not really going to be com committing or you know, contending for playoff spots on the regularity. But when they get a senior-laden team, 
maybe they can compete for an at large. Maybe they can win 10 games. We have seen them do it. So I, I think it's a good hire for him with what he was able to do at Miami with his familiarity with the conference and for what the realistic expectations are. That's going to be a team with a very good defense every single year, just like it was under Mike Elko. And if they get the right quarterback or the right offense in any given season, they can win a whole lot of games because of it. So um, for the purposes of transparency, my read on this, if I'm going to go Sammy Scoops here, is that we don't have an official offer yet that we've had. Uh Oh, we well, I just want to say, like, you know what we're saying, like, if it is a higher grading to higher, like, we'll see. We've had a couple interviews. This is what I've got. We've had a couple interviews. I don't doubt that Pete Thamel's report, he's more sourced up than I am. You know, like, I don't eh, doubt that. I don't know, Chip. I, you know a lot of people. I don't doubt that he is now at the center or at the front, you know, targeting. You know, zeroing all, in on. Targeting. Zeroing in on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but for the purposes of analysis, like, let, let's continue to move forward with this. You are spot on. I, I think that his finish at uh, Miami was a little bit of a, a twofold kind of situation because in one sense, like, yeah, you're right. Three bowl teams, one top 25 finish, 21 and 15 overall, 16 and nine in ACC play. But there were some like horrific losses in there. Mm-hmm. And I think losing to FIU at the Orange Bowl, a time when Manny Diaz goes and uh, he says that this is one of the darkest days in Miami's proud history at the post-game press conference, you know, you, you assume that the the lingering sting of some of those losses along the way helped Miami to make that decision. It also helped Miami to make the decision because they knew Mario was available. Like Manny and, and, Diaz. And Mario lost to Middle Tennessee. Again, <laughs> like that's my point about Miami. A lot of this is just Miami problems, not coaching problems. Yeah. So I I think that you know the the tenure ended at Miami in part because Mario was available, which gets me to my next piece. Let's go back. He, he is not going to be excited. No, excuse me. He's going to be very excited to see Mario Cristobal, AKA to compete against Mario Cristobal. Yeah. Okay. You know who else he's going to be excited to compete against? Mac Brown. Mac, yeah. Who back in the 2011 season? Let me see if I can get 2013. Back in the 2013 season, in week two, uh, he was the he had been the head coach since the start of the 2011 season. Not head coach. He had been the defensive coordinator at Texas since the start of the 2011 season, coming off a successful stint at Mississippi State. Uh, Manny Diaz's defense gave up 550 yards rushing to quarterback Taysom Hill and BYU, including 257 rushing yards for Taysom Hill. The very next day, Mac Brown fired Manny Diaz. Mm -hmm. So we would be introducing a Duke Manny Diaz as the chief rival to Mac Brown and also a conference rival to Mario Cristobal in Miami. I just, you want to go deeper? (laughs) SMU joining the ACC next year. Head coach, Rhett Lashley. Oh, wow, yeah. The offensive coordinator for Manny <laughs> Diaz back at Miami. I mean, I I was describing this to uh, – I was shout out to Ben Swain. He and I were, uh, were talking about this, and he pointed out the Mac Brown thing to me. And I was like, oh, wow, that is awesome for that rivalry. But, you know, I, I really think that we've got a, a position where it's familiar. It's like – you, you're dating somebody who went to the same high school as you, but you weren't necessarily best friends in high school. So you know all the same places, you know all the same names and the same stories. And because of that familiarity, there's at least a very high floor for how this can go. Who knows if it ends up meeting all of your expectations down the line, but I, I love being able to welcome him into an Atlantic Coast Conference where he's going to know a lot of what's going on around there. Don't forget he also had a stint as an NC State defensive coordinator mm-hmm. back in the early 2000s. So, I mean, our our ties here to the existing Atlantic Coast Conference are pretty deep. It's just a, it's going to be a Manny Diaz revenge tour every single week. I Look, let's go. Hey, Tyler Van Dyke to Duke. Who says no? <laughs> yeah, no, man. Just I, tentacles everywhere through this league right now. 
I, I um, I'm, I'm on board. I, I would say, uh, you know, seems like a great hire. I have no idea how it will work out. Uh, also, speaking of targeting and zeroing in, Honing in on everybody got a chance to learn the name Bob Chesney, the Holy Cross head Kenny's coach, brother, yep. Who uh Kenny's brother who first emerged as a possible target for the Syracuse job, which of course goes to former Georgia secondaries coach Fran Brown. But that doesn't mean that Chesney is out of the coaching carousel because James Madison has to make a hire to replace Kurt Signetti, who's off to Indiana. James Madison coming off an incredibly successful season and a great debut at the FBS level, uh, reportedly targeting Chesney. And I guess this is sort of what you were hinting at earlier, where it's like, look, if you're good at all these different levels, mm -hmm. there's there's something to be said for make, hiring that coach, giving them more resources than they had before and seeing what they would do with it. Yeah, it's I mean, it's the same blueprint they got with Signetti like Signetti had had success at other smaller schools at other stops they hired him at when they were still at the FCS level and obviously he was with them in the transition to FBS so now he leaves and you go find a coach who's been successful at like D3 D2 the FCS level he's won everywhere he's gone now you're bringing him to James Madison and he's taking over a program that is already established pretty well in the Sun Belt as it's had a lot of success in its first few years at this level and it's pretty easy to assume, well, not assume, but to think he's going to be just fine at James Madison and James Madison will continue rolling. So I think it's a very solid hire that makes a whole hell of a lot of sense. And while I can't sit here and say I know a whole lot about Bob Chesney and Holy Cross, I do know that the people who do pay attention to this, that like the football in the Northeast and the FCS football, think he's great. And yeah. I respect their opinions about it. So if they think he's great, then I'm more than willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. And I'll I'll follow up with just the the JMU side of this. I, I spoke with Kurt Signetti prior to the 2022 season when they were just about to to make their debut for a story on CBS Sports. And man, that administration and that commute that can Harrisonburg is a very sort of like enclosed community. Like it's one of those college towns in Virginia where like JMU is Harrisonburg. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they ride for JMU football and they care very deeply about making sure that JMU football is competitive and good and, you know, at the top of whatever they are competing for, which in this case is going to be the Sun Belt. So you introduce uh, somebody with good coaching chops to that resources fire hose. Um, I, I'm excited to see what the Dukes are going to be able to do uh, here moving forward. I heard PFT commenter is giving five million to NIL. I did too. That's actually, um, you should call for that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, fan, fans, you should call on him outright and say, uh, and say, and demand, uh, demand that he make a, a $5 million contribution to the NIL. And that big cat matches. And that big cat matches too. Mm -hmm. And not at Wisconsin, but at no. JMU. JMU. Oh, and big cat's already put 10 million into Wisconsin. He's, That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to the boys. <laughs> Coming up on the other side, we got ourselves uh, one of the best football games of the year, truly. Uh, so we are going to do what we do on Thursdays and give you your Army, Navy, locks next. A game of honor. The Army, Navy game presented by USAA. Saturday on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast, uh, we... We give that full treatment every single Thursday for the games that are coming up on Saturday. And, and Tom, I've been laying out the calendar. When we got Bowl Nanza coming up, probably going to stick with Thursdays. You know, roll out some of our bowl previews and bowl locks for the upcoming weekend. So we got to do it today. Tom, you ready to lock it up? Let's go. Since 2005, the under the games between service cameras is 40 dash. Nine and one. Give me an over in this one as well. A little two for one special. I was sick of last week. They were watching two games. I was live betting the hell out of ULN. My blue plate special five star locks are coming. Five star master lock. Lock it up. I'm, I'm, I'm living and dying at every point, every cover. 
before we get into uh, our actual, you know, picks for this game, Tom, I'll go a little like broad and, and open ended. We got five and six army. We've got five and six Navy uh, different rhythms to the season is one thing that kind of stands out to me about the way that things have have gone for both army and Navy. Uh, currently, we got army as a three point favorite. Over under a 27 and a half more on the total here in a little bit, but you know, this game's going to be 3 PM Eastern time. You can see it on CBS. You can stream it on Paramount plus what, what, what's, what's at top of mind when looking ahead to Saturday? Well, obviously for me, the service Academy under, but no, um, just like, I don't know. It's, it's a, it's the end of the regular season. This is, you know, I know we had conference championships last week, but for me, Army Navy is always the official end of the regular season. It is also one of my favorite games to watch just because of the pageantry and everything that is involved in it. So for me, I'm just really looking forward to sitting down and watching the game because I've done it since I was like, I don't know, nine or 10. So looking forward to doing it one more time. It's going to be too warm. It's in, yeah, it's in Foxborough this year. That is the one thing this year. It's completely new there. They've never played there before. Yeah, it's going to be in uh, Foxborough, Massachusetts, home of the New England Patriots, and uh, I, I'm 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 really just devastated because right now in Foxborough it's like 22 degrees, Army Navy weather. <laughs> Saturday around kickoff, 52. Yeah, That's disappointing. Come on, weather. Uh, I want this. I like the snow games for Army Navy because snow games for Army Navy really is like my memories of backyard football in the snow where we're just like going out there running, tackling and blocking. And that's the only thing that's happening. I understand that. But I, on Friday, I will be able to golf one more time. So I'm all for these 50 degree temperatures over the next couple of days. Just personally. <laughs> um, I mentioned the, the rhythms to the season because when army got out the gate, it was a, uh, it was a little bit tough. You know, they, they come out and they lose to ULM. They get an incredible win against UTSA, but then lose to Syracuse, lose to Boston College, lose to Syracuse, uh, lose to Boston College by three, get shut out by Troy, get blasted by LSU 62 nothing, lose to UMass, which mm -hmm. like at that point in the season, you're just like, oh no, Army, like if we lost the plot, you know, what's, what's happening here, but, and this is very, very significant for the stakes of Saturday, they rebounded in a tremendous manner. One week after losing to UMass, two weeks after getting blasted by LSU, they beat Air Force Yeah, in Denver, 23 to three. We mentioned uh, in the instant reaction show that they benefited from Air Force mistakes, but they turned those short fields into scores in a way that allowed them to grab hold of that game. They then beat Holy Cross and Bob Chesney the very next week. Uh, then they also go on to beat Coastal Carolina. So you go from you know late October, October's turning into November, and you're like, oh, man, this is kind of sad. You know, Jeff Monken had done so much to elevate this Army program, and then you finish with the win against Air Force, Holy Cross, knock off Coastal Carolina, and if Army wins on Saturday against Navy – they get the outright commander in chief's trophy. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm very, that's, that's probably one of the things, at least on the army side where I'm like, okay, it, I was really worried earlier in the year, but you have a chance to finish with the trophy and finish on a winning streak. So something that uh, is, is definitely at top of mind for the black Knights. Yeah. And this is like, you went over the schedule, the results clearly dictated. Like this is not as good of an army team as we have seen in recent years, but for them to finish strong and get this win and still get the commander in chief trophy. Cause like you were saying, like earlier this year, I, I thought it was pretty obvious air force was going to end up winning the commander in chief trophy. They beat Navy. And I figured they were going to absolutely steamroll army based on what I had seen from them earlier in the year. So for them to have this chance, I mean, it's just, it's awesome. I mean, they're not going bowling, obviously those, those spots are all taken, but just for, there's a lot on the line here. It's just, it's one of my favorite games every year. And for army, it would be really good to finish season, but at the same time, Navy's had a disappointing year too, and Navy really hasn't had that kind of momentum. So for them to go into this game and beat Army would be a huge thing for them going into the offseason as far as finishing on a high note. So it's it's going to be a fun game. Yeah, Temple uh, did beat UAB and ECU coming down the stretch in the American Athletic Conference to finish with a 4-4 four and four conference record. Uh, got blasted by SMU in the regular mm -hmm. season finale, but 
I mean, I, I guess that we were still just too busy celebrating that incredible uh, graphic. You remember when Navy shared the on social media the graphic after beating ECU? Yes, the pirate oh. ship being blown up by a battleship. Yeah, yes, yes. You know, we we had discussed in here places here and and elsewhere that you know Navy against ECU is the old tradition of <laughs> the Navy against the Pirates. The first true college football rivalry is the yeah. Navy versus Pirates. People think it's Rutgers Princeton. No, it's it's actually <laughs> the Navy against the Pirates. Um, <laughs> college football started in the open seas. So um, it's 1872, the oceans are not battlefields. <laughs> Uh, all right. What about the game itself? Army, a three point favorite over under of 27 and a half. Has the total gotten too low? Is it is a service academy under too mainstream at this point? Uh, yeah, probably. Everybody knows about it, but I'm still taking it. I got it at 29 and a half. It is now down to 27 and a half. What is really kind of thrown a, a wrinkle into the process is people are catching on, but are these totals going down because people have caught on or is it just because that is the way the sport has gone with the rule changes? That is the one thing. Like I came into this season expecting this trend to die or this principle to be on its last legs. And obviously early in the year when I saw these totals keep going down and down, it's like, okay, it's coming. But now as we've gotten through the year, again, the under has cashed in the first two of the three games. There's a pretty decent chance it's going to cash again here because everybody's still betting the under. So I don't know. It's It might be one of those things we just have to reevaluate. I'm on it. Like I said, I got it 29 and a half. I will still lock it up at 27 and a half, although obviously you'd be a lot more comfortable if it was 28. But still... <laughs> Anything over 24, I don't think is too much to ask, honestly. Because neither one of these offenses has been great this year. That's true. That's true. Hey, how about uh, I'd forgotten this little storyline. Army Navy's gonna be a conference game. Yeah. With uh with SMU leaving uh the American Athletic Conference, the American Athletic Conference is, will be replacing them in football at least with uh with the army. So this one, I hear that's why Mike Oresco retired. He just he doesn't want to. He, he hates the truth. No, <laughs> Shout out to Mike Oresco, big yep. fan of the podcast. You have filled our email inboxes with angry statements for years. <laughs> May you enjoy every bit of your retirement. I mean, I think it'll be good for his health because he has, he has been so mad for so long. So mad for so long. Yeah. Um. Again, Army. When is Army's arrival in the? I should have uh, next summer, right? To join AAC Army to join, yeah, yeah, yeah beginning with the twenty twenty four season. Sure. Last yeah. time is a non con game, but they will keep it on the weekend after conference championship weekend. So, just dis that's honestly, it's it's respecting tradition and disrespecting <laughs> the troops. It is both respecting the troops and disrespecting their ability to compete for conference championships. Yeah, I know. It's like, what happens if Army and Navy are playing for the conference title? Like, what? Like, it's, we've still got one more game to play. Or no, never mind. They're not counting it as a conference game. I'm sorry. Oh. I think that okay. was the wrinkle in it, yeah. Interesting. Cool. All right. Well, uh, that, that'll, again, be starting next year. It'll be like I North am. Carolina versus Wake Forest every year. Yeah, North Carolina versus Wake Forest is a non-con game to fulfill the Power 5 non-con requirement. It's beautiful. Save money on uh, plane flights. Um, <laughs> so I will also be going under 27 and a half because I like my chip line value. I want it to be under 28. I'm going to say that again. I want to have the under at a number that is under 28. So I'm also going to make a little play on the side here. And... Uh, Give me the Black Knights. Brian Newberry has done a better job with this Navy team than I might have expected, but I think the high, the highs of Army's scattered results show a quality that is higher than Navy's ceiling. So I'm, I'm a full three in the, this game is going to be a lot to cover, but I think I would rather have Army sweat the cover than try to have Navy because if you've got Navy plus three, you you basically need to believe that they have are going to have a shot to win the game at the end. Give me an alt line army minus six and a half. Ooh, 
Move the sliders. Mm -hmm. Let's Slide go. Baby over. Army minus six and a half. You heard it here. We'll take uh, we'll take Army minus three as well. Again, it is the Army Navy game. You can watch it on CBS at 3 p.m. Eastern time. That is America's most watched network, the network of stars. You can stream it on Paramount Plus. Coming up on the other side, it's been a while. Big old bag of mail's getting dusty. We're going to start breaking it out starting today. Next. We're back for an all-new season of Ink Master. This is wild. And three-time Ink Master winner DJ Tambi returns as a judge. Guaranteed there's going to be some shots fired. I gotta watch all that. You're gonna get it because you talk a lot, bro. <laughs> this tattoo is badass. That is insanity. This piece is super dynamic. You better strap in and be ready for the ride. Victory is a work of art. Ink Master, new season, now streaming exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. During the off season, especially, we we like to be able to uh, to you know interact with the Cover Three tailgate and, and with our our growing community. So one way we do that is with the big old bag of mail. <laughs> uh, one great way to get us a question for the big old bag of mail. Anytime we're going to open it up, and again, we're going to try to make sure we do this on Thursdays. Uh, or at least once a week, uh, basically, till we get started with next season. Um, go and leave us a five-star review. In that review, put your question. We will tackle it in the big old bag of mail. We also love to get live questions from the Cover 3 tailgate. Uh, so show up at youtube.com slash cover3 at 11 a.m. to be able to get that in. Also, if you just reach out to us, like we're going to have a, a couple questions that have been submitted to us personally, either by email, DMs, what have you. Uh, those are other ways to be able to get involved. This question... Uh, is from, oh, it's a, a good friend from Missouri. Straight to the point from a day one listener. You all continue to talk about USC taking a transfer quarterback after Caleb Williams leaves. Malachi Nelson is there. Why wouldn't he be the guy moving forward? He could be. But USC is interested in, depending on, you know, you read what's going on in the transfer portal. USC is going after a lot of the names in the transfer portal. So, that tells me that they're not quite comfortable with Malachi Nelson being their starter next year. Like they've been, let's see, like Dylan Gabriel was mentioned with USC. Um, who else? Cam Ward has been connected to USC as possibly going on a visit. A lot of the top names that are in the portal right now are garnering interest from USC. Now, maybe they're just kicking the tires, to see what, you know, what's out there, what interest level there is in those guys coming out there. And they still think Nelson can be their starter if they don't get one. But Actions speak louder than words in this case, and they are going after transfer portal quarterbacks. So that tells me they're not ready for Nelson to be the guy. Yeah, I mean, and I just think the stakes are too high. When, when you are Lincoln Riley at USC and you have the resources that USC has, you've got like your own reputation of being able to land transfer quarterbacks and turn them into Heisman Trophy winners. Like you don't you don't want to just sit back and and be able to just be like, I, and this guy who's totally unproven, yeah, that's going to be the guy who's going to lead us into our first year of the Big Ten. Mm -hmm. so, like The stakes are too high at a place like USC and for a coach like Lincoln Riley to put all of your offensive eggs in the basket of somebody who's totally unproven. They might have a high you know, profile, high prospect rating. So here's what I'm going to, um, and look, they don't have all the say here. I will judge Malachi Nelson's readiness by the caliber of transfer quarterback that USC signs. If USC brings in a transfer quarterback who could maybe be a depth piece, I'm going to say, oh, okay. Maybe Malachi Nelson either has shown something or they believe with the whole offseason to continue to get ready, he'll be ready to compete for starter snaps. If they bring in Dylan Gabriel to use the, you know your reference right there, or a Cam Ward, that's a bridge quarterback. They don't think Malachi is ready, or maybe they think he could be ready, but they're not willing to risk it all. I just think that for a program like USC, at a moment when they're going into the Big Ten in the modern era, man, don't don't put all your quarterback eggs in the basket of somebody who's unproven. I'll also say, like and this isn't proof of anything, but it is something worth considering and thinking about. 
when Lincoln Riley's teams have had their ultimate success and won conferences and gotten to the playoff, they've done it with transfer quarterbacks. When Lincoln's teams have relied on guys he's brought in as freshmen and developed them. Now, I know Caleb transferred to USC, but he transferred with Lincoln with from Lincoln. Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. His teams haven't had the same level of success. Maybe Lincoln is kind of hesitant to go with the younger, unproven option because of what you're talking about. But devil's advocate, if I'm USC, considering Lincoln, I feel like his offense is to a degree quarterback proof because he's such a good play caller and designer and they have so much skill talent at USC at wide receiver and running back. Maybe you're better off using that transfer portal money on the defense than going and blowing like however much of it you're going to have to spend on a QB to get them. I'm just, it's one of the interesting roster building questions that is now coming to this sport that we haven't really ever considered before. Or spend it keeping Zach Branch. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there are a couple players where you want to, you want to make sure that you want to make sure Deuce doesn't want to go elsewhere. You want to make sure branch doesn't go elsewhere. Make sure that whoever your quarterback is, is still going to have all those, uh, all those skill talent options. Um, all right, let's, let's go, Tom. You, you had this one earlier. Uh, Steve asked Tom, uh, on the show, you guys have mentioned many times how this is one of the worst Alabama teams of Saban's tenure. Where would you rank it? I would rank it as one of the worst teams of Nick Saban's tenure at Alabama. Like throwing out 2007, the very first year, like the run of where this his teams have been competing for SEC titles and national titles. I don't know exactly where I would rank it. I would say it's definitely in the bottom five, but like I – I, when I answered this question to the, with uh, Steve, yeah, yeah, when Steve asked, I answered it, I just used as a reference uh, college football references simple rating system, which is not perfect, but it it is useful for trying to compare teams year over year. Alabama's twenty twenty three simple rating is seventeen point nine two. Since two thousand and eight, the only team that had a lower SRS in that span was the 2008 team that, you know, went 12 and two lost the sugar bowl. Ever since then, they have typically been above in the twenties for the most part, but we have seen like in 2020, their simple rating system was 30.26, which is very good. 2021, 19.62 last year, 19.66 this year, 17.92. Like, I think it is fair to say that based on comparing it to previous Alabama teams, if you just watch this Alabama team, like as the question alludes to, we've been talking about it all year. This is not the great Alabama team, which is why we've also said this is a tremendous coaching job for Nick Saban and that he was able to get this team to an SEC title game, win the SEC, beat Georgia, and now has them in the playoff because offensively, they're not spectacular. Defense, they're very good. But this is also a team that struggled to beat South Florida. It struggled to beat Arkansas. It struggled to beat Texas A&M. It needed a damn miracle to win the Iron Bowl. This is not the typical Alabama team that we have seen year in and year out. And also, I know I've heard it from Georgia fans. Does Alabama beat Georgia if, if uh, Marius Sims doesn't get hurt, if Brock Bowers and Lad McConkey aren't banged up? I don't know. They did, so it doesn't really matter. But it's just it's one of those things where I think Alabama can win the national title this year, but Every other year where Alabama has been in the playoff, unless George is there alongside it, I'm usually convinced it's the best team there. I'm not convinced Alabama is the best team in the playoff this year. I think they can win it, but I don't think it's, you know, I don't think they're a huge favorite against anybody else that's in it. I think this is one of the worst, and again, like, you know, big air quotes, worst. Mm -hmm. Alabama teams of the run, as you mentioned, back to the 2008 year that when they lost in the SEC championship game uh, to Florida, you know, making it to the SEC championship in 08, lose to Florida, mm -hmm. come back in 09 and, you know, win the national, be, beat Florida in the SEC championship game, beat Texas in, uh, in the national championship game. Yeah, However, like a down year for Alabama is like the fifth best team in the country. <laughs> right, right, right. So it is one of the big air quotes worst Alabama teams of the run. It's also one of my favorite Alabama teams mm -hmm. of the run because, you know, you've got like the very tippy top when Alabama is just an absolute, like the 2018 team that's just the Quinn and Williams told us about 
Like that team was just an absolute like juggernaut, like the like blowing down walls, blowing everybody mm-hmm. out of the water. No game was even close. You just were like, wow, there's there's nothing we can do. Like the 2018 Alabama team was one of the few teams that you actually sat down and you're like, okay. Now I know the Jags would win, but you know, like doing the like, could this team beat the worst? Could team? Alabama cover a 17 point spread against? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, they probably could. In in that year, you know, 2020 or 2018, those teams come to mind as ones that I would have entertained as you know, thinking about that a little bit harder. But it's one of my favorite Alabama teams for a couple reasons. Number one, Nick Saban has told us back to training camp in August that he loves the way this team practices and that he loves the work that they have put together. And when he talks on the stage at the SEC championship game about how the way they play for each other, the way they fight for each other and support each other, I mean, he was like, we could use a lot of this in the world. And you know what, coach, you're right. Like they, they are exhibiting a lot of the, you know, I always say I don't bring morals to college football, but it's like some of that like morality, you know, some of that true, like the what values that you want to have and how you carry yourself and move about this world. You know, they say you can find it in football and in sports. Like some of, some of the best of that seems to be on display with this team. It's one of my favorite Alabama teams because I've loved Jalen Milrow and the progress that he has made under intense scrutiny. I think that it is one of Nick Saban's best coaching jobs because not only does he have one of the least talented teams by you know several metrics, he also has a new offensive coordinator in Tommy Reese. Mm-hmm. You know he had hired you know old buddy after old buddy after old buddy after old buddy. Tommy Reese was a true external hire. He had a new defensive coordinator, which was an old buddy, but you know, like you know, new offensive coordinator, new defensive coordinator, step down in talent from what you're, you used to have, and then you mentioned the Iron Bowl because if that if this Alabama team isn't the most Auburn ass Alabama team that I have ever seen, <laughs> like good defense, quarterbacks figuring it out, miracle <laughs> moments, don't know how they did it, but they did an Auburn ass Alabama team mm-hmm. I've, I, I've really enjoyed watching it these like is again in the context of Alabama these are like the scrappy underdog Crimson Tide right which is endearing compared yeah, you're not to, used to it it's usually just the Death, Death Star, Star. Yeah. yes <laughs> um all right let's go to uh, let's let's go to your question from Rick uh hey Tom huge fan of the cover three and your stuff when the playoff expands to 12 will they keep conference championships won't they do more damage than good they will either cause the best team in the league to miss out on a buy if they lose or it could cost the league an at-large spot if the favorite wins I think the long-term viability of conference championships will depend on television ratings Mm. we saw this week the SEC title game on CBS was like, what, a jillion people watched? Yes. Yeah. And then even Michigan and Iowa, a game that nobody thought Iowa had a prayer in, was an ugly, absolute, disgusting football game, had over 10 million people watching it. As long as that continues to be the case, conference championship games will exist. Once the interest, if the interest starts waning, then the conversation will start of getting rid of them and they will say it's because of you know seating so that's my theory on conference championships i think right now they're far too valuable to the networks broadcasting them for the leagues to want to get rid of them but if that ever stops being the case then yeah sure but right now like we've talked about it these games serve as playoff games right it's just not you know they don't all count as playoff games sometimes you can win it and be undefeated and not yeah sometimes you can win your conference championship be 13 and 0 and still not make the college football playoffs <laughs> even though there aren't four other undefeated teams uh, I don't, I don't know how that works. all right so i think the bid thief proposition something that we are very used to in the NCAA basketball men's and women's basketball tournament the idea that you could if you are on the bubble if you are in the 12 team playoff fighting for an at large spot sitting at home. You are very interested in the Mm -hmm. results of the conference championships because you want the favorites, the assumed winners to be in and you don't want to face a situation where, you know, if, if 
this result happens, now we're going to find ourselves on the outside looking in. With so many conferences going to top two teams instead of division winners, I don't think it'll be that clear cut. You assume that if you are one of the top two teams in your conference, you probably have a, you're probably close to an at large anyway. Yes. But there are going to be situations in other conferences, as long as we are giving out automatic bids to more than two conferences. And as of right now, there is a plan to give out between five and six automatic bids then there's going to be a lot of interest. And I think that is something that they're going to be able to sell as entry. My second piece of this is I am not ruling out if we see further conference realignment or I should say conference consolidation, mm -hmm. I would not rule out conference championships expanding. Yeah. Well, you mean so like a 14 playoff in a conference? Yeah. Ooh. That the and Big you're, Ten you're making and the them play a lot more games. Well, the, that the Big Ten and the SEC and the Big Twelve, which while they profit off the college football playoff, profit entirely off their own championship. Yeah. That if they know. are up at like eighteen teams, because you could have multiple undefeated teams mm -hmm. in a league. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was about to propose a different one, but I actually think what you're saying is more likely. You would do like the semifinals on conference championship Saturday, and you do the conference championships on Army Navy. Mm -hmm. Oh God! Or maybe they back it up. I don't know. Well, that's that's like just a, a way down the line. I believe next year, the way that it was laid out next year, the first round games, some of them will be played on Army Navy Saturday, but not in the time window. Mm -hmm. College football playoff has said that they will respect the time window of army navy not have any playoff games going on alongside it we'll play in prime time <laughs> yeah we'll respect the troops by playing in prime time but <laughs> um yeah that was i i've thought about that as these like as as people float out like a 22 team big 12 type mm -hmm. scenario you can't just have one conference championship game for that <laughs> no it's true so we'll see, see. My, my other scenario that i was going to wonder because it's like we tend to, and not just in the sport, I'm saying in, in, in human existence, we tend to ignore trends and res respond to outlier events. Like this year, it wasn't really the case, but even as we've gotten out of divisions, like you look at the ACC, it was Florida State and Louisville. Louisville had two losses going in, but NC State was nine and three, and NC State was very close to being, you know, in the ACC championship itself. What happens in a year? Did they change? Did they decide to get rid of conference championships? If you end up with a scenario where like an eight and four team that goes maybe like six and two in conference gets into the title game is a team that nobody was considering for an at large. And then that team pulls off the upset, takes out like an undefeated team who can no longer have the buy, who can no longer, you know, has to get back to an at large. And then you're sitting there with a four seed that is, you know, nine and four and is probably going to be a 20 point underdog when it plays its first game. Because again, why did they keep Florida State out? Because we didn't think they had a chance to win. So if that happens, do they then make the change of saying we need to get rid of conference championships because we can't run the risk of a bad team being in the playoff again? If the 12 team playoff were in place for the 2022 season, then Clemson would have gotten a bye. Mm -hmm. And that was like last year's Clemson team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would have had a bye. Yeah. So it'll, it'll, it'll be interesting. Uh, yeah. some, something to track all the way down the line. Look again, keep those questions coming. We will tackle them in future mailbag episodes. We are going to be back on Monday. 11 a.m. Eastern time, youtube.com slash cover three. So come and hang out with us and you can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernell. You can follow me at chip underscore Patterson. Tom, thank you very much. Thank you.